Okay, so today we've got a part two of my walk-in with a bunch of problems, all right? The, the last video I released um, this last Monday, you guys saw this walk-in that had a bad compressor, bad headmaster, leaks, uh, bad fan cycle control, just defrost clock, one thing after another, okay? So the customer went ahead and approved the replacement, so we're gonna get started on that. But before we do, I wanna remind you guys that we currently have the Sporlin BQ uh, TEV kit right behind me that I'm giving away. It'll be given away on, on my April 1st live stream. In the description of this video, there'll be a link. If you guys click the link, you guys can get entered into the contest, okay? There's no purchase necessary, anything like that, okay? Remember, I'll ship this kit anywhere in the United States. If you happen to enter and you live outside of the United States and you win, then the shipping is going to be on you, okay? And we'll figure that stuff out later. Um, also, pay attention to the, the 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 rules of the entry because you guys can get extra, extra bonus points by doing extra things such as sharing it in Facebook groups, get the traction going on this. You guys can get, I've seen some people that have more than 22 entries into this uh, just because they've shared it, they've done all the different things. So, um, you know, the biggest thing, uh, subscribe to Spoilin's YouTube channel, subscribe to my YouTube channel, you know, all those different things get you guys different points. So just click on the link and you guys will figure it out, okay? On with the video. That's currently the back of my van, me not wanting to tow a trailer. This is what happens. Okay, we are getting ready to do a change out on this old equipment. What we're going to be doing is putting new evaporators and a new condenser on the roof. And we're going to be relocating them into a new spot because I don't like the fact of all the warm air coming through the door going right into the return. So we're going to move the evaporators to this side which puts us in a good position because we can do those and leave the old equipment running while we're doing the work and then pull the old equipment down is the last thing we do. So that's gonna be perfect. So we're gonna leave this stuff running, start prepping the evaporator coils right now. So we're prepping the two evaporator coils. We've got two of them right here. So we're gonna basically put the expansion valves, the solenoid valves and get them all ready so that way when we hang them, we really don't have that much work to do. I'd rather, if you can, do this work outside of the building because it's easier than trying to do it up on a ladder. So we're taking advantage of the situation that we have. So we got the coils kind of mocked up and then um, you know, we'll go through the expansion valves and put them in and all that good stuff. So when we pull this panel off, you notice there's a lot of data on the side of this panel right here, okay? This is essentially telling us what size nozzle, and if you look right down in here, we're gonna put inside the distributor housing and that's gonna help us create a pressure differential with that valve, okay? So notice that it says it's sized for 90 to 100 degrees liquid temperature. So that has a lot to do with the way that the expansion valve is gonna feed, okay? So we've got two different style nozzles right here, and we basically use that chart, and then we cut this distributor cap right here, ream it out, and then we're gonna push the nozzle inside. The one thing I will say that I don't like about the heat crafts anymore is they used to not braze this shut, and it used to just have a plastic cap. And the plus side to that was when I cut this, there's going to be a burred edge and it's going to be hard for me to push that nozzle up into there. Yeah, I'm going to deburr it, but there's always some pinching action that goes on when you cut something with a tubing cutter. So before, they used to just put a cap in there and the nozzle slid in effortlessly. It is a little bit more of a challenge now, but it's not that big of a deal. So this side is going to be where my expansion valve and my solenoid valve is mounted. So we're going to get to it and then we'll go through the selection. So we are going to be using R448 a refrigerant right here r448 and uh, essentially we find our coil model number which is a 9000 btu coil so we go with a 90 then you follow it over and the nozzle that we're going to use is an l1 nozzle so if you look down in here one of these should be an l1 nozzle yep this one's the l1 nozzle right here so we're going to use this nozzle then we're going to discard the other one or you can keep them but just make sure you write uh, you know what they're for just in case you ever needed to do some work you can save the nozzles for later but yeah so that's where we're at we're using R448A one of the most underrated things you can get from Sporlin a lot of people don't know about these is their BQ kits dig these things comes in a little box I've had mine forever it's the BQ balance port expansion valve kit you can find all the different bodies and they have more than just here and you select the cartridges and then you select the thermostatic expansion valve uh, power heads. Now this one doesn't have the newer refrigerants on it because this is a really old kit, but essentially we're going to look at my heat craft book that came with the evap coil. We're going to find our uh, head pressure control valves um, bypass rating, which is 150 PSI. 
we find our evaporator coil BTUs, which is right here. The LCA6, that's six fins per inch, and then the 90 is the multiplier by a thousand, that equals your BTU. So this is a 9,000 BTU evaporator coil. We're gonna follow that over to right here. We're doing 448A plus 25. It requires a uh, SBFDEA-C. So that's uh, dash C is medium temp, the A is the cartridge size, the D represents the 448A, and then the SBF is just the body style. Now, we don't necessarily have to put just the FBF, okay, or SBF. I'm putting in an SBQE body, that's a three by four by two. That's this guy right here. Then the A is my cartridge size, so I've got a cartridge right here. This kit, basically normally build them. You just find all the different cartridges. And then we've got the power head, so we're gonna assemble the valve. Alright, so we're going to build the expansion valve. What we're going to do is put a little bit of lubricating oil on the O-ring, just a tiny bit. Usually use whatever refrigerant oil is in the system, or if you got the right kind of nylog, you can use nylog. I'm using nylog blue, which is POE safe. Okay, we're going to put the cartridge inside of the valve, tighten it down. Essentially, you're going to go snug. Now, Sporlin makes a little triangle tool to do this. It's a little plastic tool, so that tells you that you don't want to torque these things down. So essentially you're going to go snug and then just, there, that's it, just a tiny hair pass snug. I'm going to put a little bit more lubricating oil right on this. We're going to tighten the power head on. And their book says to go 60 degrees past snug on the power head. You do not want to over tighten the power heads. So we're essentially just going to put this guy on the power head, grab my other wrench. Bottom side. Sometimes you've got to find your happy number here. There we go. That'll work. Okay. And then I'm just going to use the leverage of the two wrenches against each other. And go about 60 degrees past that point. There you go. That's it. You don't want to over tighten the power heads and you have an expansion valve. Last thing you got to do is take your cartridge identifier. This says A valve or A cartridge. And you need to put it on the power head so the next guy knows that there's an A cartridge in this valve because there's nothing on the body that says tonnage when you build a valve. So that's it. Valve's built and we're ready to install it. So I want to cover something. This is a liquid line solenoid valve and I want to cover a common misconception. This liquid line solenoid valve has a 3 8 inch line size. But we do not size a solenoid valve via the line size. It is not completely unthinkable to have a bigger solenoid valve as far as line sizes go and have reducers reducing the line so that way you could have a 3 8 inch line potentially going into a half inch solenoid valve, okay? Solenoid valves should be sized based on the tonnage of refrigerant that is being pushed through it. So you gotta look at your condensing unit and how much refrigerant, what the tonnage is and what it's moving through that valve and that's gonna determine what you do there. Because of the difficulty of the burr from cutting it, what I try to do is score it with the pipe cutter and then snap this off. But you have to be careful because it's a, you have to find that happy number. If you try to snap it and it's not scored enough, then it'll just bend the pipe up here. But you see, I've got a score on there right now and I'm gonna try to take some channel locks and snap off this piece right here. So it's gonna be hard to see, but you can kind of see I've got the nozzle all the way up in there. I just used a screwdriver, pushed it up. It's gotta be all the way in there and flat pressed in there so you're good to go and keep in mind you can actually see the number stamped on the nozzle too it says number one so we're good to go so we got it hey heat craft are you guys going to replace my expansion valve when it goes bad because you guys didn't braze with nitrogen i just cut the end off of this and they braze these shut when i cut it look at the inside of that and watch what comes out of this thing it's ridiculous. This thing is full of carbon flakes. This is unheard of. Hold on, let me get this right here and we'll catch this. Look at what we're scraping out of this thing. So hey guys, make sure you uh, purge or blow these things with the nitrogen before you install, assuming that the factory did their job right. This is kind of ridiculous that I have to deal with this stuff. So who's gonna pay for the expansion valve that I install when it fails? because it plugs up with crap. I think that's pretty uh, ridiculous right there. 
So I haven't braised anything in yet. I'm literally just cutting lines. So it just makes me wonder if this whole thing is full of that stuff. That's pretty ridiculous. All right, so we're gonna be braising in this TXV. We're trying out hot block. I've never used this stuff before. So we're gonna see how well it works. I guess I should have put some up on the distributor housing up here, but oh well. Already I'm getting like off gassing or moisture coming out of the hot block, which I don't like. But I, I've seen this on wet rag too. So let's see what we can do. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting like an off gassing coming out and I don't dig that. See how well it braised joint goes. Okay, we're good. One of the things that happens when you're using the wet rag is when it's really hot and it dries. When I say the wet rag, I mean the heat compound. Um, it dries and then you have to use like a stainless steel brush to, to scrape the stuff off. And I'm curious if the hot block does the same thing. So that's what we're testing right now. The other thing I don't like about the hot block that I'm seeing right now is this blue dye they've added to it. I really think that's a little unnecessary because it gets blue on everything. See, I typically run a little heavy on my solder. I'd rather use a little solder than not have enough. Okay, we've hit every joint, so clean it up. Overall, it did a decent job. Definitely gonna have to clean it, just like I have to clean the the wet rag stuff. I would say it's uh, equally uh, dissipating the heat or absorbing the heat as much as like the wet rag stuff does. Uh, the only thing I don't like about this stuff is the blue dye. But I'm still going to have to take my stainless steel brush and kind of, you know, brush this stuff off. But I mean, I still like the heat compounds. I think it worked great. You know, I did a good job keeping the valves cool. Cooler. I mean, they're warm, but, you know. Yeah, sweet. Good stuff. So that's the hot block by Solder Weld. Yeah, I'm not liking that blue stuff. It's it's making a mess with blue dye. That's that's not cool. Uh, but I mean, it's good stuff. It's a heat absorption putty. It's nice, but I don't like the blue dye. There's blue dye everywhere, so I think that's kind of silly. It's kind of like uh, leak lock. It's like you got leak lock all over your hands and crap. It's kind of not cool. So now we're gonna try this with the Viper wet rag and see what we get to. I have a feeling we're gonna have good results. Well, I mean, I know I've used this stuff before. I just, I don't have blue dye all over my hands. I mean, there's residual stuff from the wet rag, but it's not blue dye. So, so I, I don't want to talk crap about the hot block. I mean, it's not horrible. It's good stuff. It's just, I don't know what to do with that dye. So far, my favorite is the wet rag. So we just braised the joints with the Viper wet rag. The, you got to be cautious because that putty's really hot. But I cooled the joints with a actual wet rag after I let it cool for a minute or two. And then now I'm gonna go ahead and pull it off and we'll see how much of this stuff gets stuck. I also added more moisture to it, so I'm wondering if that's why it gets real flaky is because it didn't have enough moisture before. But we'll see, we're gonna pull it off right now and see how it looks. So without trying too hard, this is what just fell off the pipe and we have a little residual left. But what I'm realizing is it still comes off fairly easy and that's where it's dried. So the last time I used it, I had a lot of this. This time I have a lot less because I had put more moisture in the wet rag, just a couple drops of water and mushed it around before I used it this time. So the key is, is to make sure there's a lot of moisture in the putty. So, but like, see like that's dried to the pipe. I'll get my steel brush and brush that off, so. Okay, so this is what is left after I used 
the Viper wet rag and you can see there's a little residual. But what I've realized is, is that's just because it's dried out. So the last time I used this stuff, this stuff was everywhere. It's not as bad this time, but before I used it this time, I added moisture to it. So just a couple drops of water. So yeah, this is the leftover. So I will have to use a wire brush to get that off. But I mean, it kind of flakes off with my hand pretty good too. Okay, so we're in the attic. Nothing's permanent yet, but I've got supports and stuff holding the line set up, hanger straps, we'll straighten it all out. There's like a little droop right here, but we'll clean that up later. We're just doing the brazing right now. We've got some nitrogen flowing over there through the other side. We're gonna make a braze tomorrow right here. So today we're just doing the line set on top of the boxes. Tucked all the way over there. We're gonna run the liquid line real quick. It's already run down to the coils. We haven't brazed on the coils yet, but we're just doing it. So I like to support them whenever I can. You can't always make it look like this, but. All right, so we got the new coils hung. We got them uh, piped in refrigeration wise. Uh, we got the penetrations taped up and spray foamed, temperature controller, TXV installed, insulation done. We're gonna come back tomorrow, do a condensed unit, drain lines done. We ran the new drains all the way over, all the way over here, got a nice pitch on it. We're gonna leave these ones running, the old ones, temporarily, and then we'll demo those later. So they're still operating. Tomorrow we'll come back and do the switch over on the condensing unit. Yeah, and that's it. Then we got to do some electrical. We still got to pull electrical. We ran the conduit, but we got to fish it to each coil tomorrow when we do the switch over because we'll steal the power from these ones over. So that's it for today. It's kind of nice when you can do it like this because then we're not in such a big rush. So we are currently in the process of doing the piping. We're gonna get this all supported nice and good. Braze it in, insulate it. We're doing electrical too, so a little bit out of time. Okay, so we are doing a tightness test with the field piece manifold. So, we're going to turn on our nitrogen. And basically, bring the pressure up to about 150 PSI, then we're going to push enter, it's going to start a timer. I've also got my temperature clamp on the suction line and that's there to compensate for the temperature change in the system while we're doing the pressure test. There's a common misconception that nitrogen is a completely inert gas so therefore it never changes temperature or never changes pressure via temperature but that is actually false. Nitrogen does change pressure via temperature although it is a very small amount depending on uh, you know, temperature change, like so if you did a nitrogen test overnight, it's very possible that you'd come in and the system would be, uh, have changed a little bit. So anyway, so basically this is going to tell us uh, the amount of percentage changed in the amount of time. So it's a pretty cool little test. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and cut it off. 160 PSI. We're going to give it a minute to kind of calm down, let the system stabilize out. Okay, so we're kind of stabilizing out, so we're going to go ahead and press enter to start. And it started the timer. And it's going to tell us the change. Okay, now we pass the tightness test. Everything looks good on that. Last but not least, we're going to uh, turn the vacuum pump on. Open the gas ballast. Cool thing, fuel piece vacuum pump. You can see your oil right there. Nice and good. Alright, so we're going to let that run and watch it on the vacuum app. So far I've done one oil change. Oil is pretty nasty, I just used a Gatorade bottle. Mitch I wrote, do not drink on it. <laughs> um, cool thing about the oil change, I don't have my other little, it came with another container, but you just open this valve, it dumps it into that container, you close the valve, you pour new oil on the top, you put it to the fill zone, and you don't gotta turn off the vacuum. It's really cool. So, um, but yeah, I've done one oil change so far. You're looking good. 242 microns we're trying to get down to 200 and then we're going to do a decay test and hope that doesn't come above 500 so far we're looking good uh, i'd say we're about 20 minutes into the vacuum um, i'm just using the appion half inch uh, hoses that have a 3 8 connector at one end and a quarter inch connector at the other and then i've got appion core tools on there so working good so far all right continue to charge it so I'm charging into the liquid line. I had my guy downstairs pull the solenoid magnet off the coil, so we should get this slow down here. Because basically, I had magnets on the solenoid valves for the vacuum test. 
So I wanted it to kind of stop at the solenoid valves instead of flooding back to the compressor with a bunch of refrigerant and stuff. We got it off now, so now we're just gonna let it sit there and charge. We're gonna have to turn it on to charge in the rest. It's only gonna take a little bit. But we're using a R448A. Thanks to our California government, they passed a new law that says new installations, we, ha we can't use 404 anymore. So we'll see how this goes. So this is a 448A and uh, I'm still charging it, so we've got a high suction pressure, but it runs really similar to R22. Look at my outdoor ambient is uh, 60 degrees and I'm running 175 head pressure, 174, my liquid saturation temperature. So uh, we're not done yet. I'm still charging, but yeah, we're putting 15 pounds. That's the what Heatcraft is the maximum charge for this system. I just got a phone with tech support and they basically advised me just to go with the 15 pound charge and, uh, and then check everything after that. But that should be enough for the winter charge. So there we go. That's our full charge. Now we're just going to let it run, go downstairs, check the evaps, see how they're doing. Okay, so we're all finished up. Unit's running. We're going to let it run for a bit and I'll come back and check superheat. Put some stickers on it that label it as R4048A. And then I'll tell them to get a roofer to come out and take a look at that roof jack. I'm, I'm not a roofer, so I, I'll just seal it up and then he can come out and do what he wants to do to it. So, yeah, and that's it. All right, it is down to temp. Everything's good. We're going to let it run for a day and then I'm going to come back and do superheat. Just want to let it cool the box down all the way. Everything's looking good, good so far. And then as far as the old holes go, we got tape over them, we'll come back and pull them. Once that stuff's dried, you can see the foam's kind of coming down. We'll come back, cut the excess foam off, and then they'll have to clean their ceilings. I'm not doing that. So. Okay, so, um, you know, that was just a basic walk-in cooler install. Like you guys saw in the video, I shared a couple key points. I can't show the whole thing because this, the you know, we were there all day long, but I like to show a few points of the install. Um, I really dig on the, you know, showing you guys the Sporlin BQ kit, how you can use that. That's a very, very valuable tool. And like I said in the beginning of this, I'm doing the, the giveaway on that. So, you know, guys, look in the description of this video and you guys will see the link to enter the contest, okay? Um... Uh, some important things that I wanted to point out was the sizing of the liquid line solenoid valves. That's a really important factor. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. Okay. Um, really appreciate you guys taking the time to watch my videos. Um, please consider subscribing if you haven't already. And I will uh, catch you guys on the next one. Okay.